Hi everyone, I'm Cornelius of Voice Studio East, and this is the third installment of the Singing Demystified video series. This one is going to be a little bit more complicated than the previous two, because today's topic is resonance. Resonance is fundamentally about a phenomenon known as constructive interference, which happens when two waves line up so as to produce a stronger wave. For example, when pushing a swing, the pushing can be thought of as a kind of wavy movement. I know this might sound a bit contrived, but bear with me. If we push while the swing is coming towards us, we are simply slowing the swing and making it move in a smaller arc. But if we push it while it is moving away from us, then we are adding to its momentum and making the arc larger. When our pushes are timed in this way, we say that they are in phase with the swing. Accordingly, we may talk about the phase relationship between our pushes and the motion of the swing. And this phase relationship determines whether our pushes produce constructive or destructive interference. In the case of a swing, we only really need to worry about pushing at the right frequency. If our pushes are completely out of phase at first, the swing will come to a standstill, but then it will begin moving again, this time in phase with our pushes. However, if our pushes do not match the resonant frequency of the swing, we will keep going in and out of phase, and all the constructive interference we achieve some of the time will simply be neutralized by the destructive interference we achieve at other times. Let us now explore how all this relates to singing. To begin with, setting aside breath support, singing can be divided into two areas, the larynx and the vocal tract. In this context, it is customary to refer to the larynx as a sound source and to the vocal tract as a filter. Sound is generated by the sound source and then flows into the vocal tract where it is filtered, that is, given shape which is what allows us to discern vowels. More specifically, the sound source is something known as a valve oscillator that works by modulating airflow. First, imagine that the glottis, that is the space between the vocal folds, is open and there is a steady stream of air going through the larynx and the vocal tract. That is, imagine a slow, steady exhalation now, imagine that this airstream is constantly being interrupted by the vocal folds coming together only to come apart again a moment after. As the vocal folds close, the airstream through the glottis is cut off, but the air above the vocal folds still has momentum that carries it upwards through the vocal tract. This creates a vacuum just above the vocal folds. That vacuum then pulls on the air further along in the vocal tract, which causes the vacuum to move through the vocal tract until it reaches the mouth. Here, some of the sound is radiated outwards, but most of it is actually reflected. Depending on the timing, the next sound wave from the larynx will interfere either constructively or destructively with the reflected sound. This is similar to the swing. Sound reflection can be thought of as the swing reaching its highest point in the air and then changing directions. If we can time our pushes to match the motion of the swing, energy will build up and the swing will go higher and higher. Likewise, if we can time the emissions from the sound source to match the reflected sound in the vocal tract, sound energy will build up to be louder and louder. As with the swing, the process is technically gradual, but in singing, the process happens so quickly that it sounds instantaneous to human ears. This, then, is resonance. By shaping the vocal tract to match the pitch we are singing, we can get a lot more loudness for a lot less effort. Now, the vocal tract has multiple different resonant frequencies that can be manipulated independently by moving the larynx, the lips, the tongue, the pharynx, and so on. That is how we create vowels.
Therefore, it would not be entirely wrong to say that resonance tuning works by shaping our vowels to match the notes we are singing, which is why vowel adjustments are such an important part of singing technique. For example, there is a resonance tuning known as yell timbre, which works by tuning the lowest resonance of the vocal tract to the octave overtone of the note we are singing. It sounds like this. Hey! Many genres of popular music rely a lot on this, especially in the fourth octave. To achieve this sound, I am raising the larynx using a large mouth opening and using open vowels like E and O. Closed vowels like E and U will not work with this strategy in the fourth octave. This is because these vowels require the first resonance to be quite low. We can actually hear the first resonance of the vocal tract by closing the glasses and flicking the throat. Now hear how this resonance changes as I change the mouth opening. You can even hear a faint indication of vowels when I do this. Changing the size of the mouth opening, however, is not the only way to change the resonance. There, I started with a lowered larynx, then raised it and added twang for the brighter sounds. As we go up in pitch using any given resonance tuning, we need to gradually brighten the sound. We can do this chiefly by raising the larynx, adding twang, opening the mouth, or moving the tongue, all of which will slightly influence the sound of the vowel. If we find that the vowel is becoming too distorted or that the sound is becoming obnoxiously bright, we can switch to a different resonance tuning. There are three main resonance tunings that keep cropping up. We have already discussed yell timbre, so now let us turn our attention to the other two, the first of which is whoop timbre. It sounds like this. Like with yell timbre, whoop timbre relies on the first resonance of the vocal tract, but this time we're tuning it to the song note itself instead of to its octave overtone. It is most often associated with falsetto, but it can be done in chest voice as well. In the fourth octave, it will tend to go along with closed vowels like E and U. But most classical singers will gravitate towards whoop timbre for all vowels if the pitch is high enough. Finally, we have F2H3 tuning or second formant third harmonic tuning. Quite a mouthful, I know, so let us break it down. Formant simply refers to resonance, so now we are tuning the second resonance of the vocal tract instead of the first. The third harmonic is simply the second overtone, that is, the octave and a fifth overtone, if we know our overtone series. So we are tuning the second resonance to the octave and a fifth overtone. It sounds like this. Oh! This is very useful for singing high notes, especially in mixed voice. It is most easily achieved with back and central vowels that are neither too open nor too close, like o, a, and e. We have now figured out what our options are with regard to open vowels, closed vowels, and back vowels. This leaves us with the front vowels, specifically those that are too open for whoop timbre while also not being quite right for yell timbre. Vowels like e and a, e, in other words. Rather than relying on some particular resonance tuning, we need to cover a lot of territory using multiple different resonances amplified by the use of twain. I will go into greater detail on how this works in future videos. But for now, it is enough to remark that these vowels should be kept sharp sounding like this. E e e Notice the metallic buzzing character. This is partly a result of twang and partly a result of loudness. 
We have now taken an inventory of which vowels require which approach to resonance. But sometimes we may want a different sound than this will give us. Perhaps we want to sing the word hello at a high pitch without sounding shouty. Or perhaps we want to sing the word me with a more dramatic sound than whoop timbre will give us. In that case, subtle vowel adjustments will no longer suffice, and we will instead need to outright substitute the vowels. Hello might become hello, and hello from the other side might become hello from the other side. Conversely, me might become me, and for me, for me, for me, might become for me, for me, for me. There is no right or wrong here. It depends entirely on the timbre you're looking for. Future videos will explore in greater detail how to use these different resonance strategies. For now, we have reached the end of today's video. This has been part one of a three-part series on resonance in singing. The next part will explain how resonance relates to voice cracks and pushing. In the meantime, you can check the description for a blog post on resonance, and if you have any questions, be sure to leave them in a comment below. Stay tuned, remember to like and subscribe for more content, and as always, thanks for watching.